Welcome to our Lift the Lid uh, questionnaire tonight and our webinar, which I'm very, very excited about. And thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for all the fantastic questions that those of you who've sent in. We've got a bit of work to do to get through them. So this wonderful campaign, Lift the Lid in Schools, is being um, obviously on, on behalf of Rotary, um, Australian Rotary Health and QBD. I often get that tangled up books. I know exactly where they are and what they do. Um, we are really, really passionate about lifting the awareness around mental health and well-being. But before we launch into that, can I please do an acknowledgement of country? Um, I am down south of Sydney, so I wish to acknowledge that I'm bringing this webinar from the lands of the Dharawal Nation and acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are the first peoples of this country and are proudly the longest surviving culture in the world. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their continuing connections to their ancestral lands. May we all walk with gentle feet and compassionate hearts wherever we are in this wonderful country. All right, so for those of you who don't know me, um, my name's Maggie Dent and I'm a parenting author, educator and a former teacher and counsellor. I have written eight books. What? Gosh, I need to stop doing that, don't I? Including my two best-selling books, Mothering Our Boys and the 2020 From Boys to Men. I'm also lucky to be the host of the ABC podcast, Parental as Anything. And in July this year, we published a book based on the uh, most asked podcast topic. So as I said at the beginning, this is something really passionate to me. Um, I've been working in the area of well-being for children and families and students and teachers for over 42 years. Gosh, am I that old? And so this pandemic has kind of brought a lot more stuff up for all of us. And we are concerned for our children and our teenagers and actually for all of us. So tonight I'm joined by two fabulous humans, um, both wonderful researchers in the area of youth mental health and mental health generally, Dr. Claire Kelly and Professor Carolyn Donovan. And I'm gonna hand over to them so they can introduce themselves, isn't that a bit lazy? And talk about what they hope to get out of tonight's conversation. So very first, Caroline, you're first. Welcome. Thanks so much, Maggie. And thanks, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. And I think, as Maggie said, we're all very passionate about the mental health of our youth. So um, I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm an academic in the School of Applied Psychology at Griffith University. Most of my research generally lies around um, child and youth anxiety, depression, sleep and body image issues. Um, I've also got a very strong emphasis on digital mental health. Uh, mainly because we, we found out very early on that access to um, really good evidence-based treatments was lacking in this country and particularly in our rural and remote areas. So um, we worked very hard to develop our BRAVE program some 20 years ago now, and it's still going, um, and to increase that access and make sure that all Australian people have got some um, and families have got access to evidence-based treatment. So I, I guess that working with kids and teens and families, I find to be really important. I've got a really um, strong belief in the importance of early intervention so that we can change what could be really, um, I guess, problematic trajectories for youth um, who have mental health problems. So it's all about trying to get to these kids as early as we can um, so that they can live the best lives that they can. Um, and I hope that from this webinar, um, we, I can be of some help to somebody. And, and I know that Maggie and Claire will be a lots of help to lots of people. So um, I hope that we can answer some of your questions and um, give you some tips on, on how to cope with this pandemic um, and the anxiety and depression that might've come from it. Thank you so much. And now Claire, your turn. <laughs> I feel like I should start with a bit of fangirling. I think anyone who knows me will have heard me recommend one of Maggie's books or the Brave Online program, which I'm a massive fan of. Um, so I'm, I'm all a flutter. Um, <laughs> but I'm, um, I'm the Director of Research and Curriculum at Mental Health First Aid Australia. So um, although I, I certainly have worked across the lifespan, my focus has always been young people, particularly sort of adolescents and sort of up to 2021 that sort of overall age group um, and starting to move now a little bit into the primary school area and our focus at mental health first aid is on recognizing that someone 
uh, maybe developing a problem and in need of support, how we can actually have a supportive conversation with them that makes them feel heard and ready to accept um, help of whatever type it might be, whether that's professional help or some additional support in um, in their sort of social sphere, parents and teachers and, and friends. And um, yeah, we've, we're actually uh, celebrating our 21st anniversary at Mental Health First Aid sort of almost as we speak. Um, so yes, thank you for having me. And my real hope is that everyone who comes here tonight takes away just a few little things that they think, yeah, this is gonna be something that I can apply right away. Uh, I think that this has been an incredibly tough couple of years for all of us, but I, I, I think that we all particularly feel for our young people who have been cut off from friendships and, and activities and sports and, and all the rest of it. And we've got a long way to go to, you know, hopefully getting them all back on track. So Claire, can you just mention a little bit about, um, you know, your connection to Lady Gaga? Oh, if I must. We're basically best friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's uh, it's wonderful actually. I back in uh, 2018, um, I took the the teen program that I have to say Australian Rotary Health were um, major financial and in spirit um, <laughs> uh, supporters of the teen mental health first aid program right from the very beginning. And in 2018, I took the program to the United States and there they actually had funding from Lady Gargoyle's foundation, the Born This Way Foundation. And uh, that was extremely exciting. Um, but uh, once the program got uh, got started over there and the first, I think it was um, the first eight schools was their original pilot program, she actually invited um, two kids from each of the schools that initially had the teen program over there um, to meet her at a, <laughs> an airport in Las Vegas. They're all sitting around in a circle talking about mental health and people are sort of walking past going, is that Lady Gaga? And, uh, and then she actually invited them all on stage with her that night in a concert. So, and they all talked about um, the program and and she actually talked about her own experiences of trauma and, and PTSD as well. So she's been a, a fantastic supporter financially and also in just really making the conversation really loud, both herself and her mum um, who works for the, the foundation too. So yeah, so basically best friends. We haven't met, but. <laughs> it's good enough. No, but I like very I, close. <laughs> I just think that's just woo, that. I just imagine how exciting it was. Now I need oh, to really say was. thank you again because we got lots and lots and lots pages of questions. So, in order to be able to cover as many of them as possible, what we've done is cut them down into themes, and we're going to kind of talk about them. And each of us, if we feel we've got something else to contribute, we will add into it. So, the very first one is we're going to start off with our littles, and of course, um, for some of it's it's that transition back to school after lockdowns that has come up so many times, um, and and that they are feeling a little bit anxious. And so I just want to just throw one thing out is that um, they have actually many of them, you know, um, the ones that were here last year have done this before, and that's one thing we need to remember. But also the second thing is um, I just know how fantastic early childhood educators are, particularly around this because they know exactly what children need to help get rid of them, lower their anxiety. They'll have bubbles or whistles or songs or they'll turn up dressed up like Teletubbies <laughs> or whatever. They will actually activate the fun cycle and they will also prioritise play and playful activities so that children can start to feel more comfortable and safe in reconnecting back to children that they have played with before or even new ones. So I need to just say... If you are one of those wonderful teachers, thank you. But now I'd like to throw the question to Caroline. What can parents do uh, for kids coming back? And, um, you know, those little ones who maybe started this year, but they've had such a long break and a really disruptive year. Yeah, the poor little preppies. It feels like they just started school and then they were whisked away. And it's, it's almost like they're doing their first day of school all over again. They haven't got previous... Um, you know, years of schooling to kind of remember and fall back on um, and parents have probably just gotten through those difficult first few weeks and then they were whisked away into lockdown. So I think it's really difficult for everybody and parents need to um, give themselves a little bit of a break as well and understand that it's hard for parents and it's hard for kids. So 
everybody needs to take a bit of a breath and realize that you know everyone's doing the best that they can and you're all doing a great job just getting through it so um, but when you do go back and that sounds like it's starting to look like that might happen at some point which is great um, it's almost like thinking about it as being like the first day of school again and all the things that you did on the first day of school just bring that back um, you know so so parents are going to be a little bit nervous too just like you were on the first day that the little preppy started school um, but trying to kind of keep a bit of a lid on your own anxiety and and keep that sort of positivity around for the children so that they they feel the excitement um, they they do tend to feed, feed off us you know they look to us to see if this is something they should be nervous about um, and even if you are feeling nervous sometimes you have to fake it till you make it uh, and and sort of put forward that sort of this is a great thing and we're going to be fine and and so on so just trying for the parents to also stay calm which I know can be really difficult um, so I think that's one thing that could be helpful um, talking to them you know if they're a bit nervous tell them it's okay to feel a bit nervous it's not something to be embarrassed or ashamed of um, and it's also okay to be excited and nervous at the same time because they've got this kind of weird thing where they're excited about going back but they're also nervous and they're teeny and they don't really understand what the difference between those two emotions are so you know you just remind them that they were okay before lockdown and they're going to be okay after lockdown as well so I think they're important getting them back into that routine you know where, where you've, they've been in one routine with homeschooling most likely um, and now they have to get back into a different routine and to try to make it as predictable. Kids really like that um, routine and knowing what's happening. So, you know, it might it might be that that first day back at school that you have a really kind of um, strong plan about what that's going to look like. And then you're going to do this and we're going to wake up and then you're going to go to school and this is going to happen. And after school, we're going to get some ice cream and we make it a bit. <laughs> Got to have the ice cream. <laughs> oh, yeah. We always, it's ice cream always come into the first day of school. <laughs> Um, you know, so that it becomes something that they look forward to, but they know exactly what's going to happen during that day and during that week. So it doesn't seem so scary about going back um, and reinstating things like play dates that they haven't been able to probably do for a while. Um, but to get that social connectedness back and they can, they can rejoin their friends. Um, I think those things are really important and praising them for doing all of those brave things as well. Um, even if they're really small little things, just to show that you really understand that that was hard for them and that they did a great job. So they, they would be the most, the sort of important things that I see. Yeah. Okay. So I had just a couple of other things to pop into there. Um, don't forget uh, little love notes uh, in their lunchbox or a message on their banana. Um, anything you can do to just say, go, oh, that little pick me up because it's, you know, they are going to the little ones. It's separating from their safest caregivers. And, of course, they've been with you so much. So anything that can kind of give a sense of connection. I know there's some mums have put little hearts on the back of their hands and they've got one as well. Just little things sometimes make a big lot of difference. My other thing, too, is probably if you've got the shyer children, um, maybe stand in front of the mirror and practice them doing their welcoming and their hellos and their because it could be a bit rusty. And so that they might have been more familiar with that later. So let's do pretend or role playing. Let them be the teacher and you be the little child. And then the other biggie is if you can possibly um, make sure that you arrive the same time a little friend has arrived. We tend to find that if they can go in with a little friend, um, that definitely makes it a little bit better of a transition. And it's exactly the same as, um, you know, what Caroline said. Habits take a while to form. And so, you know, they can actually have massive meltdowns when they come home because they've been trying so hard. And of course, if you've got a little boy, he might also have held on to a poo all day because I don't <laughs> tend to like pooing outside of home. Um, so just be prepared for that, that that's not a sign that anything bad is happening. That's a sign your child's just a little bit exhausted with this new environment and all these new changes. Um, and again, that's why we suggested the ice cream on the first day. So seriously, but not necessarily every day of the week. Okay. <laughs> So, Claire, um, let's talk now about, you know, our primaries. And a lot of that will apply to them. Of course, they're a little bit older. Um, how about when we're getting into our kind of tweens and teens? Because, you know, heck, am I in, am I not? Um, have I got friends or not? Um, the social dynamics can be a bit tricky. So what suggestions do you have for reluctant kids in those in that age group? Um. 
Secrets of the Universe. Um, <laughs> yes. Look, <clears throat> you know, I actually think that the first thing we've got to remember is that um, they may need permission to try the things that they want to try themselves. And so actually sitting down and saying, well, what sort of, what sort of support would you like from me? Or, or what do you think might work? Do you want to talk through some of the, the ways that you might start a conversation or, or get, try to get back to the things that you were doing before and and let them just try it out, let them be wrong, let them uh, suggest things that uh, you're a bit concerned might not be quite the way to go um, and really just not, without focusing on finding a solution, practising finding different ways that things might work out is probably a really good start. I think it's it's really important as well that we we don't have really high expectations of achievement this year it actually really worries me and you know i think i'm going to say this to all of you parents out there as well i i feel like for the last 18 months i've been i don't have kids myself just the cats um but my friends who have got kids of, of sort of almost any age they're talking about oh i'm working full time and i'm homeschooling and, and i just feel like i'm not coping and i think of course you're not coping no one's supposed to cope with this. We're not, and the kids aren't either. So please, if you if you can be kinder to yourself and expect a little bit less of yourself, that's actually good role modelling for them as well. They they really don't have to be the top of anything at the moment. Um, and you know, I think it's um it's it's a really useful thing to keep in mind as well that kids, particularly those who are most anxious, and we're really talking about you know up to you know, 19, 20 years old as the frontal lobe is continuing to develop, um, kids will often interpret expressions of worry or fear on their parents' faces as expressions of anger. So if you are really worried, they can feel as if they're doing something wrong. Yeah. And and when you combine that with the fact that they often feel as if they're somehow a burden, you know, that if they have emotional needs, they, they may be a burden on you and, you know, you've got your own stresses and worries and, actually just taking the time to make sure that you're in the right frame of mind to have a conversation about oh, I mean, about anything, about getting back to school, about what they've missed out on and what they feel that they are not going to be able to catch up with or that they're not going to get the marks that they wanted to get or you know that the football team just didn't get to play this year. Whatever it is, just being willing to sort of listen and say, yeah, you know what, that sucks. It really sucks. I wish that this wasn't happening this way. That's one of my favourite lines, I reckon. Don't you reckon, Claire, when you when you work oh, with yeah. young people, if if they can open up to you, that the last thing they want you to do is try and fix something. Oh yeah. They, gosh, that sucks. That's just just a double suck, and really kind of because being validated that you know oh. this is really tough, and I think sometimes it helps them validate to you when you're doing it tough as well, which is exactly what you're commenting on, and I think. My only tip too for tweens and teens is a natural pull away from parents. Um, and, you know, one of the things they're really worried about is, um, you know, upsetting parents or disappointing parents. And so when we sometimes have this lovely, well-meaning thing, I want to tune in and see how you're feeling about going back, you know, they can shut you down and don't be upset if they're doing that. You know, don't be upset because they've got some stress they're trying to deal with. They're trying to work out how they're going to do it themselves. And remember, being an adolescent is stressful. You've got brain changes. You've got body changes. You've got limbic brain changes, which are emotional changes. You've got physical. You've got the whole thing going down. So that means change triggers stress. So they're already stressed. They don't need you then stressing them about how they're feeling about it. So again, we really need to kind of go, let me know if I can do anything to help you. That's probably one of the best things. Um, and I would sneak something yummy <clears throat> into their lunchbox, probably not a message <laughs> on the banana, but anything <laughs> with chocolate in. Um, so what you're trying to do is put a bit of lightness in the day. And mm. I can tell you again, they won't have the same meltdown the younger ones will, but there can often be some angst later for the same reason, because they've been doing the best they can in an environment that's still foreign. And I think that's what we have to be, be really realistic about it. And just sometimes I'm going to tell you most powerful things sometimes aren't words, they're gestures of kindness. You know, do something just a bit thoughtful, you know, make them their favourite snack or, you know, make a hot chocolate or something, especially when they don't deserve it. 
mm. while they're in transition mode. Does it have to be a reward? Absolutely. At the end of the day, mm. that just does something that their words couldn't explain to you how good it feels anyway, but it just makes them feel more loved and safe while they may struggle day by day. Yep. Absolutely. I also think developmentally, I mean, this is, I mean, as, as you've said, this is the age where they need to become more autonomous. They need to be more independent. They need to individuate. And for a lot of them, they've been robbed of the chance to do a lot of that over the last 18 months. Yep. So if they pull away more, you know, they're probably trying to catch up a little bit. Yep. <laughs> Don't fuss. I think it's, uh, it's a good time to just, just let some things lie, I think. Oh, I think so. And um, one other thing came up so many times. How do we engage teens to talk when they don't want to talk? Now, this is, <laughs> so we just let everybody know we probably weren't very communicative either when we were teens, right? I mean, where do we think that we were so, oh, well, I'm going to be so much more aware they're going to talk to me. I had four sons. Trust me, if I got a grunt out of one of them, I was a pretty good conversation. Um, <clears throat> and I know that comes up sometimes um, with a few of the other things in here that we communicate in lots of ways that aren't just words. Yeah aren't we? You know, and that's the other thing that, and I'm a really big believer if you've got the older children, you know, in the car, <laughs> captive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I wouldn't be so, I'll do never interrogate them about the day. Never interrogate them because they haven't, well, boys haven't, don't even, can't even remember what happened usually. Um, but even then, just if they want to talk about it, they will. So just, just you know, give them a bit of a, here you going, whatever. But bottom line is they are kind of expecting you to want to know what they've been doing and exactly what Claire said, they're trying to be their own person right now. Yep. But the best big message every time is just let me know if there's anything, you know, I can do if there's, you know, any way I can support you. Um, and, and to tiptoe around sometimes and not take some of these slam doors and roll dies very personally, because, <clears throat> you know, at the end of the day, they can't always have the words. And I love what you said before about misreading things. Oh my goodness. How many mm. times have they, you know, mum might have kicked a toe when she came in through the door and she's got an angry look on her face. Like, oh, what have I done wrong now? Like, you know, that, that defensiveness and the last thing they need in after a pandemic is any more of, of anything that puts more stress on them. So I think what we have to do is work out ways we can support them to reconnect to their friends in real time. How can we make that easier? Can we create, you know, camping trip possibilities in the Christmas holidays? They've got something to look forward to. So I think it's, it's about making it as easy as possible for them mm. to gradually stretch because exactly, um, as Carolyn said, these are new habits too because all their habits have been taken away. Yep. So any other yep. add-ons to that? Oh, before? yeah. Look, I, I just as you were saying that, I was thinking I'm sure I don't want to generalise that this is boys only, but I've read no. it's something that you saw a lot. If every time you're alone with a kid, you try and start a conversation, they're going to avoid you. They're going to avoid you. So sometimes it's fine just to be quiet. Sometimes it's fine to say, do you mind chopping veggies for dinner? Um, or, or not do anything at all. I mean, <laughs> it's a pandemic. If there's ever been a time to binge watch The Simpsons with your kids, <laughs> this is it, you know. <laughs> But if they know that they can spend time with you safely without being interrogated, they're much more likely to come back later on and say, yeah, maybe I do need to talk about something. Yeah, yeah. I exactly. Agree. I think small little bursts, you know, you go in and you say one little thing, a little comment, and then you leave and they go, oh, yeah, okay, well, mum will talk to me for two seconds and then leave. She's not going to try and sit me down and have a big yeah. conversation. Yeah. The look of the lecture yep. coming. The look of the lecture. <laughs> We've all been guilty of it. I have a 17 year old myself, and I did just resonate there where you said grunting is about the best you get. That's all I get. Um, and it is for the parents out there, it mm. is very difficult. It is a hard time for parents, and it is difficult. It's a bit, it's a bit heart wrenching when the adolescent starts to pull away like that. Yeah. So just to understand that I do, it's hard not to take it personally. It really is. Um, but, but maybe this is the first step to them not living with you in their 30s. That's right. That's the positive. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I think that's a really important message um, is, is that what we want to keep saying to them is that, you know, I, the reason I want you to learn how to do your own washing and unpack the dishwasher and cook is because one day I want you to leave home and go and live with your friends. Mm. So I'm wanting you to have the life skills that mean you can be a competent person later because 
you know, that would be so much better than being useless, you know, like, and then just leave it because I will really think about that. All right, we, we have had a few questions from parents who have neurodivergent kids or kids who already were managing high anxiety and um, even some, you know, mental health issues that were more complex. So all of this uncertainty has definitely been even more tough on these kids. Is there anything different that you might suggest at easing them back into the social world again or school? So is there anything we can offer those parents? Yeah, I mean, I think um, for the really highly anxious kids, um, it can go one of two ways that they can worry a lot about the pandemic and worry about being homeschooled or it can be a blessed relief for them because they now don't have mm. to worry about being social and all of that. Mm. So it kind of depends where, there's, where their anxiety is and what their anxieties are, but all of them are going to feel a little bit nervous and more nervous than they were already about going back to school. So, yeah, I think this, um, you're actually you're exactly right, Maggie, this is going to be a, a big deal for a lot of the kids who are clinically anxious or subclinically anxious as, as well. Um, so sometimes if they're, you know, sometimes what we see with the highly anxious kids and kids who've got clinical disorders already is, is school refusal where they're refusing to go back. And if that happens, you know, if that does happen, you can speak with the schools. They're wonderful in terms of going a, a nice slow return to school rather than, oh, you have to go, you know, for six hours every day straight for, off the bat. Um, you can start them at half days or, you know, two or three days a week to get them back if that's really what's happening. Um, obviously, we like to try and get them back as soon as we can. But if, if the option is they'll end up staying home, it's much better to kind of slowly and speak with the school about doing that in a sort of a slow way. Um, and again, with the routines, making sure that they know what to expect so that it's not scary for them, um, I think is also important. Um, <clears throat> we've had a, a number of teachers, <clears throat> excuse me, coughing, a number of teachers who um, have signed up, which is great to see you all here. And can I just say thank you for absolutely everything you've been doing. Um, for those of you who've had children at home while you've been doing remote learning. Um, <clears throat> okay, so some of you have asked, is there anything that you can do or what else you might do to help prepare your classroom or make it easier to transition? And I, I, I just think that, you know, the younger, you've got to remember that these are children coming with cortisol with a little bit more anxiety. So um, you are the big person in their classroom, which means you can influence neurotransmitters best, better than anyone else. So it's, it's about making it as fun and as engaging and as play-based and as bit ridiculous as possible because when they're laughing, they can't be really anxious and stressed. And what you're doing is bringing everyone into a slightly better space before you might also create activities that get kids maybe even um, talking to each other about it. I love the circle talks or paired talks where we have a bit of a chat about the last few months so that... Children have a way of kind of connecting with others, not necessarily their best friends, but that we don't just leap straight into formal learning um, because we've got to make the environment safe again before we can actually get them engaged in learning. We need dopamine for learning and dopamine's a fun neurochemical, not a cortisol one. So I look at connection, <clears throat> your relationship with them. Remember that, you know, that that's the number one thing, relational safety in our, in our classroom environment. So double connect, maybe, you know, be at the door and, and fist bump or hello or remember their names or give them funny stickers or whatever, anything that shows that you've seen them as they come into your classroom. Um, <clears throat> anything else around the environment that can be a little bit more fun as you transition in. And then I always think of where's your calmness activities? I think you've got to prioritise these now again because, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, that was my first book. <laughs> it's all about why we need calmness in our homes and classrooms. Gosh, that was well ahead of its time. I'd be doing some mindfulness activities. I'd be doing some um, relaxations at times because what we want to do is we want to make that kind of normal that we're able to do some things that um, bring our children into a more calm state so that, that they, can, they have the energy to interact and they have the energy to learn. And then the last thing is cohesion. I think we've got to look at how do we make our schools socially more cohesive? So we've got to look after our staff because um, they're all coming back from a very stressed environment. Um, we're still living around the edges of possible shutdowns and lockdowns. So 
there's a lot of uncertainty still happening. And I bet there's a lot of your teachers who are missing loved ones like me. I have a little grandson on the other side of Australia I met and I haven't seen him and he's three months old. And we've got lots of that happening. So a lot of us are dealing with grief as we go back into anything, whether it's work or school. So be okay with tears and sadness and validate that that's also okay as we go into this space. So any other suggestions for our teachers? Uh, I'll go for Caroline first. Uh, yeah, I think um, what you were saying, I agree with all of that, uh, Maggie, and I think that validation of what it's been like for them is really important. So, you know, if you can get into little groups and, and talk about the lockdown experience as well, like what was it like? What did you, what were some of the difficult parts? What were some of the fun parts? Because there will have been both. Yep. Um, and to also for teachers to acknowledge that we know that for some kids, it was really bad. You know, that for kids who might have been in domestic violence situations, yep. don't know what the experience was for all kids. So to not sort of be too kind of Pollyanna about it all yeah. being wonderful, but to mm. sort of just highlight the fact that everyone had a different experience because everyone's got a different family and has a different living environment and so on. So, and, and to know, acknowledge, like what, what were you a little bit worried about coming back you know, and, and have a talk about it so that they can go, oh, that kid was also worried about that. And I'm not the only one who was a bit nervous about coming back. So we normalise their kind of, worries and experiences and then maybe start talking about what they were most looking forward to coming out of lockdown so that we kind of end in on a sort of a, a more positive forward thinking kind of note so yeah I think that that can be really helpful to have the conversation about the lockdown about the good things the bad things and then what they were nervous about coming back into the school situation I think that can be helpful definitely yeah cool yeah I, right. I, I've got to say for the um for calmness activities, yes, I, I think the mindfulness activities have got so much going for them. I, I really love the the Smiling Mind um, app. That's my personal favourite mindfulness app. But they've got some fantastic programs for schools for kids of all ages. But also, like, where's your calm corner? Mm. Now, when it becomes just too much, when it's like I have been in a, an apartment with my parents and my little brother for the last. 18 months and all of a sudden I'm in a classroom full of kids and I've got this this feeling about germs that I don't know quite how to deal with and I'm supposed to be really cool and and now I'm suddenly overwhelmed you know where can people take a little break you know I think that 15 minutes of being able to decompress and and feel a little bit better and be ready to come back to the classroom is probably more important than the, what they'd learn in that 20 minutes you know, as a way of transitioning back yeah and I think what we we did touch on it briefly, but for grown ups, it's okay to validate our own worries and anxiety. I think this is a time that oh, our children yeah. need to see. When you go through hard times, all humans will will have moments that they feel, you know, crabby or tired or sad or, or whatever. And I think our kids have learned something from this that um, you know, that what are what are our parents doing? So please validate there are times you're going to feel stressed and what are you doing about it? Now, it's absolutely all right to go and hide in the bedroom and eat really high quality fruit and nut chocolate because it's really a health food. Um, but have a calm down chair, exactly what Claire said. I've got a calm down chair outside. And I started doing that in my own home at times with <laughs> testosterone driven boys. And it didn't take long before they were sitting in my chair and I had to make another chair because they were using <laughs> my calm just Anyway, so the next question is, and this one really, um, I'm probably going to throw it back to you, Caroline. How, what, what sorts of, you know, signs do parents look at that could be more than just a, an anxiety about going back and starting again, that there may be early signs of mental health issues in primary school children, particularly things, when does the anxiety become problematic and how do we know that they may be verging on depression? What, what do parents look for? Okay, so anxiety and depression are, are a little bit different. So I'll, I'll probably talk about one and then the other. So um, I'll, I'll go with anxiety first. Um, so, so basically, yeah, all, all of these mental health problems are on a continuum. We all have anxiety because anxiety yeah. has been put in us from an evolutionary perspective to keep us safe. So it's not a, anxiety isn't inherently bad, actually. Yeah. It can be useful. But it becomes a problem when we feel it at a really high level or it goes on for a really long time or it stops us from doing the things that we want to do or that we need to be able to do. That's when it becomes a problem. Um, and there are different, I think the different 
the difficulty with anxiety is there's quite different types of anxiety. And so people can get confused and think, oh, that's that one's anxiety and also that one. So it might be helpful to kind of talk a little bit about the different types of anxiety that you might look for. Um, the one that we're going to see in, and that we have seen most often in primary school kids at least is separation anxiety. So these are the kids that probably right from the start were always a little bit worried about being away from mum or away from home. Um, but now it's in a bit of overdrive because they've had 18 months at home with mum and dad and now they're having to really separate after being forced really to be together. Um, so these are the kids who don't didn't like the first day of school too much. They particularly like camps and sleepovers, might not be like very much being left with a babysitter when you go out to dinner, that kind of thing. So when it's sort of stopping them from being able to do those things that other kids can do, that's when we know that it's sort of starting to go from just a little bit of a twinge about something to something that they might be a bit more worried about. And it's the same with social anxiety, those shy kids that we talked about earlier. You know, there's, there's shyness and that's, there's, there's lots of shy kids. And then there's the kids who are really anxious, really very worried about what other people would think and not liking to answer questions and not being able to interact well, um, not wanting to do their talks in front of the class, that kind of thing. Um, so it goes from being sort of just a little bit on the shy side to not being able to do some of the things that other kids can do. Um, and then we've got our warriors uh, and we, we're seeing that a lot also mm. in the pandemic. Mm. Okay, like everyone's a little bit worried because it's a, it's a thing to be worried about. It's something we've not um, hit before and we don't know what to do with it and how to react with it. Um, but these kids probably worry about lots of different things. And so not just the pandemic, but climate change and family finances and health of everybody and economics and all sorts of things that kids don't really need to worry about. Um, and they have trouble stopping. So it's hard to distract these kids. It's hard to reassure these kids. Um, and they're becoming very, very overly distressed around it. So I, I guess they're all signs that, that, that we might be just going from what we might call normal levels of anxiety to something that we might be a little bit more concerned about anxiety. Yeah. And what's the youngest age that you've had a child diagnosed with a significant mental health issue? Was it primary or is it, is it what? Well, uh, for anxiety, we can diagnose them as young as three. We can reliably diagnose them at three. Yeah. Um, and that's mainly because anxiety is often quite temperamental. So they're often come out that way for want of a better term they're sort of anxious kids from the start mm -hmm. so we can diagnose them quite young depression and other um, mental illness is much more sort of primary school level as a general okay. yeah okay so um we know that it's not easy to get in to see anybody at the moment so if say we're a couple of weeks in and a parent's decided that yeah no this is we're still really struggling to get them there and they're really distressed at night or some of their behaviours have regressed or whatever. Um, um, what sorts of options would you recommend? Do you, do you let the school know? Do you go to your GP? What, do, what steps would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, we, can, we know that mental health plans are great and, and that, you know, Medicare is great in terms of covering um, and helping and finding psychologists. The problem at the moment is that the wait lists are extremely long and people are having to wait um, too long really for the assistance that they need. So without giving my own program a plug really, but I'm going to kind of, um, <laughs> great. <laughs> we, we do have great, there are other programs like it as well um, that have been tested and they work just as well as face-to-face -face therapy and they're free. So Braid is available for free to all Australian families. We've got one, we've got programs for preschool children for primary school children and for teens so okay. like I can't it's just there and that's what we made it for we didn't do it for any other reason than to, to make sure that everyone has access to evidence-based um, practice so if they're struggling really struggling with anxiety and you really feel that you need some help there are parent uh, so there's a child program teen program but there's also parent programs to tell you how best to manage your anxious child and I think that they can be really helpful for parents just to give you a bit of a few tips on how to do it as well as going through it with your child as well. Okay, so the next one is that the teacher's asked, how can I make my 
classroom more supportive for um, children with mental health challenges. And I'm just going to throw my little piece in here first, and that is just once again being aware that you have that, that you actually have that information already changes the way you interact with them. Um, but it is, it, it's very much working with the parent. And I think it's also working one-on-one -on -one with the child to work out how do they feel safest in the room? Do they prefer to sit closer to the front, the, at the back? Do they like to be with a friend? In other words, we meet some of those sort of obvious needs, but what else can teachers do um, if they're aware that this is what I like, the calm corner in the, uh, in the quiet chair? Another one is um, I've had um, teachers, and right through to secondary, have giant teddy bears in the back of the room. And so if a child's struggling, they just pick the teddy bear up and have it on their lap. And not only does it give it a sign to the teacher that that child's struggling, um, the bear itself is doing the work of soothing. And I think sometimes we've got to get a bit creative, don't we? Any of your suggestions on that one? The name of the program is, Bra is Brave, isn't it, Caroline? Yes, that's correct. Yep, perfect. You just Google it. It'll be there. It's fantastic. Yeah, if, if you look at Brave for you, it's Brave for with a like number four, you. Um, and yeah. um, I, I guess the only other thing I could think of, um, I like all of those little suggestions and I think it's really good that kids have safe spaces in the classroom to go and to calm down. And just, I guess, a little bit of knowledge too to just, you know, talk to the kids about mental health issues. If they understand that kids are struggling and that this is what they need to do, when that other child then goes and does that, it doesn't seem so odd or unusual. It, it's sort of just this is what we do in our classroom when kids, we're not dealing with things very well. So I think sort of talking about that that's okay um, yep. and why sometimes we need to do it and when we should do that, I think it's really helpful too. Okay, so Claire, how do we initiate a conversation with a young person? who we're a little bit worried about on mental illness, mental health, especially when we're worried about them. And let's kind of focus a little bit older. So what are your thoughts? How do we have that conversation? I'm worried. <laughs> maybe um, <laughs> is this mainly as a parent or maybe as an educator or as a family friend or somebody who's concerned? How do we start that one? Gosh, you know, let's just say any concerned adult. Yep. Because I've, I think that while there are certainly things that a parent can do just, you know, or guardian just because of proximity in in the home i i think that we you know a lot of kids are fortunate to have a lot of really great adults in their life and it can be coaches and um it might be in fact sometimes it's health professionals who aren't mental health professionals who might um, need some of this as well i think it's actually really important to start off by um being able to have conversations that aren't about mental health yes um being Connect able to talk first. about <laughs> yeah yeah and look and and that you know there's not this fear of on exactly as we were saying before on oh, no, i know that face we're about to have a conversation about mental health so i'm about to go and play I, do you know what i can't think of the name of a single video game but <laughs> video games <clears throat> i haven't had one since the atari in the 80s um, but being able to have conversation, and I think we've got to have conversations about important things when they don't matter. When things come up on the news, you hear something about, you know, oh, you know, have you seen that, you know, people are really concerned about the mental health of, you know, kids going back to high school? I mean, what do you think about it? Is it something that you're concerned about? Um, giving them an opportunity to to talk about it without having to say, yeah, it's actually me I'm worried about as well. You know, do you have any friends that you're concerned about? You, do you have any ideas of how you'd support a friend if they if they didn't seem to be travelling too well in the next few weeks? Um, I think the I think that any activity where you can be sort of side by side without having to look at each other is a good one. And the car is obviously a big one. I know um, when I was growing up, it was always washing the dishes. Yeah. You no. Know? Um, <laughs> much now. <laughs> no, it does, and I've got to say, you know, my, my dad eventually bought a dishwasher. I don't know if that had anything to do with, <laughs> maybe you just didn't want to hear anything else. Um, but uh, the, the beautiful thing about those things as well is that they are time limited. So the kids know exactly when they're going to be able to escape. So that's kind of your contract with them as well. Let the conversation end at that point. Um, I think being able to say, hey, look, you don't have to talk to me. I'm, I'm concerned, but you don't have to talk to me about it. It just really matters to me that you talk to somebody about it. So 
who could we make and maybe that maybe it's a coach maybe it's uh it's somebody else from school maybe it's a, a family friend or um even if another friend's parent you know I, I had one of those mums that everybody liked to talk to um very sort of level-headed and, and able to just sort of listen and and not offer solutions and i think that that's it's really really hard not to take it personally especially if it's your own child and you love them and you want to be the one that, that does everything. Sometimes you just can't and just not taking it personally is so important. But I, I generally, I've got sort of three steps to starting off a conversation that's going to be a tough one. And the first one is sort of, Hey, you know, are you okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? And when you get the, mm -hmm, or the I'm fine, which is very convincing, then the next thing you might try is, well, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm, I have been a little bit worried about about you lately. Are you sure there's nothing you want to talk about? And if they start to open up at that point, because you've you've actually expressed it, you know, this is this is a little bit about you. I'm worried, so you know, I would like to talk about this. Um, and then if we're still not getting anything, getting a little bit more specific about, you know, what are the behaviours? Listen, mate, I I just I feel like you haven't spoken to any of your friends. You're not re returning phone calls you're not returning text phone calls what's a phone call yes. not returning text messages um you, you don't seem to be engaged pointing out those things specifically and not in a you're doing the wrong thing you need to change your behavior sort of a way but just is it because at the moment spending time with your friends isn't as much fun as it usually is and why do you think that that might be um if it's if it's just you, know, you might hear things about you know oh, nobody misses me nobody cares if I'm around or not that's the sort of thing that I would be really concerned about that can, that is a pretty fundamental change in the way that a young person may be thinking about themselves um but I, I think as well uh being able to say you know we don't even have to talk about it right now we can talk about it another time you know uh, possibly leaving the the little you know, the, the brochures around the place that people, that kids can pick up and go, oh my God, mum, you're not subtle, um, roll their eyes at it, but they're still probably going to read it. That can be really helpful too. Um, some great sort of resources around. And, and also, you know, there are evidence-based self-help strategies that you don't really have to point out as self-help strategies. You know, if kids I think that it's it's really hard to sort of get yourself moving when people say you've got to stay inside. But we do have the opportunity to exercise and how much are we actually taking that opportunity? If a young person is not sort of getting out in the sunshine or the rain, but at least the fresh air, uh, at, at least every second day, they're probably not getting enough exercise, not getting the, the neurochemistry boost that goes along with that not seeing the neighbourhood dogs, not seeing the green spaces that are so important to our mental health. Uh, so that's a really good one. Um, and I think as well, you know, we've we very appropriately um, have been letting kids probably have a little bit more screen time than, than is ideal over this time because, goodness, you know, you just, just need everyone to have an easier day sometimes, don't you? But now might be the time to actually start cutting that screen time down a little bit, improving quality of sleep, having a good sleep sort of ritual, which involves no screen for the last hour or so and sort of calming down, cooling down, having those sorts of rituals. But I also think that there's just not a, there's not a right way or a wrong way to start a conversation. You know, some kids are going to be really receptive to, hey, come on, you know, I know that something's going on. Let's have a chat. You know, and, and for others, it's it's going to need to be a lot sort of slower and, you know, when you're ready, is there somebody else? You can come back to me another time. And Claire, I've always found too that um, when living in a house with um, young people, I might be worried about one of my boys, but I would frame it like are any of your friends getting stressed out about the exam. So <laughs> I'll throw their friends under the bus because um, it kind of makes them think a little bit about, yeah. oh, you know, and it's kind of not me at them. And I always found that was really good. But when I was really worried about something, and I think I actually have this, a draft of this letter in my From Boys to Men book, but I know that it's also in one of my blogs. Um, I wrote a concerned mum letter and I, I very rarely wrote them, you know, and that was basically what you're sort of saying, because, you know, boys are notoriously hard to engage in conversations um, in the adolescent years. 
for a whole lot of reasons, uh, particularly with mum, who's always stressing and worrying and wants to know stuff and they're trying to keep secrets and we want to know everything. And um, oh, it's very frustrating. So they're pulling away and we're wanting to hang on to their coat strings because we really love them. Um, and I think that the mum letter for me was just significant, particularly for like, I have two boys I can talk to. You know, they're my lambs. I could just say, you doing okay? And I go, no, nah, not really. And I could have a little conversation, but they probably, I might say that. And then about three days later, I might check again. And that's when often they open up, not the first time because I haven't thought about it, but the fact you brought it up means they think about it and then we'll have the conversation. But with the rooster boys, no way are they going to talk about anything that's vulnerable. Um, <clears throat> and so I wrote these kind of mum letters and I always started off with something loving. It's the old feedback sandwich, you know, you know, I love you more than all the hairs on the bears and, you know, whatever just been really worried about this sort of behavior because I've seen you do this and say this I'm very specific and then yeah. I go down at the bottom if you do want to talk and if not you know I remember you've got great people in your life who love you and it's that lighthouse figure always suggests somebody that they already really value and know um, and um, it was so funny because years later two of my boys were living together um, in Sydney um, because of course Perth was too small for the rooster boys and um, uh, they, I sent down some raffle tickets and they actually were pulled the letter out of the letterbox at the same time both of them said oh, I'm not opening that and the other <laughs> one said I'm not opening that so they went well it's a mum letter and and neither of them had ever known the other had got a mum letter but they didn't they sat it on the bench and didn't open it. I had to tell them it was just raffle tickets um, and I feel that's another thing at different times. We save it for really important stuff. Yeah. And then they, they read it and they think about it and they give it some thought. And then there may be something a little bit down the track. And mm. I, we've had quite a few questions about how difficult it can be to talk to teen boys. And, and so I have a blog, I think, about um, some suggestions for teen boy communications, particularly the unmotivated teen boy, who you're going to have a lot more of those because, you know, like, the things that shift them into a positive state of motivation they haven't been able to do the only thing they've been able to do is online stuff yeah or if they were doing physical stuff they're not doing it with their mates which is the other reason of how they develop affection and friendships is they do random crazy stuff with people kids they like doing whether it's skateboarding or surfing or playing music or something so I think my first suggestion around those things is always um <clears throat> always kind of anything in this transition period you can do to get them back into those things um you know offer to have the noisy boys over in your house a fire pit um anything you can do like you know just even a huge afternoon tea a pizza evening anything to kind of return them into something they haven't done for a long time will be really positive and helpful and just know that boys can be really non-communicative because they're really they don't actually have a lot to say sometimes. We think they should, um, but they just don't have the same necessary need to have conversation. <laughs> yeah. And I, I write a whole piece about timing. Look, timing, oh, seriously, there is a, it's a really big thing with, um, you know, particularly boys that they've just got out of bed, they're not even awake, not done after school, not when they're eating, not when they're on their phone, not when they've just mm -hmm. been off the phone or texting, not when they've just been gaming, not when they've just, name it, there's only about two microscopic windows that you can jump in there. But it is about respecting them and where they might have that window for us. And you can get really good at it. And sometimes you can let them know, I'm just looking for that window when I can just jump in and say something or I might just say can we have a chat like tomorrow and that may set up a sense of okay so there's one coming um, and wherever it is again it's not the eye contact thing because it really shuts them down they always tend to find that really confronting so it's the 45 degrees or 90 degrees or 180 <laughs> Um, and quite often that made it easier for boys even in the ones I taught in my classrooms quite often I'd sit beside them or near them but not anywhere with the face and that can make it less threatening for them okay all right now our girls let's talk about our girls they are experiencing incredibly high levels of um distress and mental health issues at the moment what are your top tips both of you for supporting them i'll start with you claire and back to caroline what what tips have you got for us to be able to communicate with our girls 
particularly in today's world where, you know, it's not easy, is it, being a teen girl and being able to manage your space on online and in a real world that's just a bit crappy? You know, I I agree. It's 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 very difficult. And although obviously there are going to be some girls who aren't great communicators yep. and some boys who are, yep. let's just agree <laughs> that there are some generalisations yep. that are helpful. I think... Um, <laughs> I, th I think big thing is is actually again still just being able to have conversations that don't matter that are just fun yeah. actually being able to enjoy each other um more frequently than you have sort of the heavy conversations um choosing your moment is still going to be super important i think that anything you can do that um makes uh, your daughter feel or, or you know girls in the classroom as well feel special, um, feel that something about them is unique and, you know, that there are qualities about them that are, that you personally value, um, being genuinely curious about the things that are going on in their lives without expressing any kind of judgment about them. Um, being aware as well that um, however angsty they're feeling, if they are upset about something, they are exactly as upset as they are. Now, I think that's a thing we can, Far too often I hear people say, oh, girls can be just so dramatic. Yeah, because things are dramatic. This is horrible. You know, if they're, if they're upset about something, they are upset about it. And if, you know, if the things that are causing you that much upset as an adult, if people were dismissive of that, you'd be really upset. So just let them feel their feelings for a start. I mean, I think that uh, being able to sit with that without trying to fix it is really or really shut hard it down really. shut it down or, or fix it, it either one no yes, just <laughs> gosh just don't say don't cry please just you know hand over the tissues and the chocolate um and, and we have a cry with her maybe um but but still and, and another one you know i think that um you know we we often feel like we don't want to sort of go into problem solving mode um, and I think that with girls, because girls tend to be more likely to sort of, um, to not actually have a solution that they want, I guess, just being able to talk about the way that they're feeling, just be able to maybe try out some emotional literacy as well. You know, it's not always about mental health. Sometimes it's just about having big feelings and, and wanting to be able to sort of put a name to them. Um, I think it's really important as well that we, when we have whenever we have an opportunity to talk about um social media and media in terms of what people want us to see and therefore want and therefore buy we've got to have those conversations frequently i mean i think um you know it's something that i wish that every parent would show their kids there's a fantastic instagram account called influencers in the wild and it's where people have managed to take a candid shot of someone who is getting a decidedly uncandid shot of their effortlessly glamorous life for their Instagram. And um, when you realise just how absurd it is, you start to see exactly how much of an illusion all of that is. And I think that um, you know, we know that media literacy programs actually can have a, a, an effect on eating disorders and body image. Yeah. This is really important. You know, I think that we've got ideas about eating disorders that, you know, particularly that it's only if somebody is, is very underweight, has been over-exercising and under-eating and making themselves throw up. Actually, by the time we see the evidence of an eating disorder, it's probably quite entrenched. So we actually want to start having these conversations when it's just about body image, when it's about saying, oh, God, all, all the other girls in my school are prettier than me or, or whatever it might be, whatever that sort of language is, and and uh, steering some of that towards, well, you know, first of all, how important is pretty? You know, I mean, are you a good friend? Are you, are you working hard? Are you, you know, do you like to look after animals? What are the things that you are actually putting out into the world that aren't about, you know, conforming to some extremely bizarre and very specific cultural now moment of what that, what beauty should actually look like. Gosh, and again, I, th I think that, you know, we're, as adults, the, the one thing that I think is the only rule that you have to follow with kids is to actually just go, is this working? Because if it's not, I need to try something else. Just be flexible. You know, don't take it personally if a conversation is, is going badly. If there is eye rolling, <laughs> let the eyes roll. Trust me, you did it as well. 
Um, <laughs> and don't assume that just because you haven't had a, a really great reception about what you've just said that they're not hearing, you know, let them take it in, let them think about it, let them Google it and come back to you if they want to or talk to somebody else if they want to. But also don't ignore gut feelings if you're sure that something is really wrong. You know, as much as kids have the right not to get help if they don't want it, when we're talking about the risk of harm, totally different ball game and we do need to take action at times. Caroline, what would you like to add on there? Um, I have a book right here. I think that was um, that mm. was a great discussion. Um, I think, you know, if girls, there is that kind of thing about girls being dramatic and girls telling you everything. I can't, I can't think of anything better. I mean, I think it's <laughs> great. Sometimes you know where you're at. You know exactly where you're at. And sometimes you wish they weren't quite as open as they are because mm -hmm. they tell you things that you think I would probably have been better <laughs> off not knowing that. But, you know, so the more they're telling you, the better it is. And I think if you listen and not lecture, I think that, mm. keep that in your head, I have to listen and talk with them and not at them. So, so they'll tell you things about something they saw on Instagram or what their friend did and you in your brain you're going, oh, no. to kind of just take a step back and say, oh, really? And, you know, how do you think that made that? Oh, she must have felt a bit horrible when that happened and sort of talk with her, with her about it rather than, at her about why that was bad or what you think or, you know, talk with them but still get your ideas across but in a much more conversational and sort of um, talking with way rather than talking at. That can be really hard sometimes. Um, I think another one too, um, we do know that um, in, you know, a significant number of female brains that when they're upset, the limbic brain fires up and the next part of the brain that fires up is the word centre. So quite often that need to vent isn't necessarily a conversation, but it's actually a great way to discharge. It's a bit like the tantrum of the two-year-old, except it's coming out in words. And some of the words might not be what you want to hear out of your daughter's mouth or the child you're teaching, but they may be discharging a lot of that angst out of there that in 24 hours, they may come back and go, wow, I think I've overreacted or whatever. But that vent, a vent is actually a way of, expressing big feelings which we know that self-harm is increasing you know which is a way that they're managing big feelings because they can't express them other ways so I think at times we need to recognize that um can maybe I you know I love it that there's a meme out there that says so do you do you want me to just listen or are we going to problem solve like because if I'm going to listen I'm going to sit back and hold on while you just go for it and I will not offer any suggestions, but I'm going to let you vent till you run out because they do run out. Then they go, Phew. it's the same as when we've had a really good cry. Yeah. We get to the, uh -huh. well, that means the nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system has finally been able to restore itself back to a calm place. And it's a bit, if you can keep in mind with all of our kids, that when the glitter jars all shaken up, it's not a time to be one am to tell them how they should be or what they should say or what they shouldn't say or what's wrong with their hair or how are they going at school. When the glitter jar is all shook up, we have to wait till the glitter settles because otherwise we're not able to access what part of a prefrontal cortex they have and we can just make it worse. And I didn't say it was easy, but I do say it's easier if you bend your knees, if you're standing up and you breathe deeply into, in, into your gut and maybe hold your hand on your heart so that you can remember you love this child. But you might need to consciously group yourself to know that this is actually a way of a, an adolescent managing some big stuff with a safe person. So if you could see, it's like an honour and a gift yeah. because you are this safest person. So it is. It's so you know, is, that, yeah. that's huge. Yeah. You might and need to go and have a shower yeah. afterwards or eat more chocolate, but at the end of the day, they will feel better. And um, that's, that's part of what we have to do around mental health. There are times that we can get flooded with a big motion. It's not that we're bad or weak. It's just that sometimes big stuff fires up irrationally, doesn't it? Um, and it's because we're human. And I think there's one of the things I keep on, you know, kind of sidestepping every now and then. People sometimes talk about good emotions and bad. I'm sorry, they're all oh. real and valid. Yeah. <laughs> some, some come out a bit hotter than others. And, um, 
we don't always manage them very well ourselves. So my one of my big tips is, um, and my boys will tell me even this today, when I got really cross at them, I went for a walk. And so um, because I'm a farmer's daughter, that's what I did. I just walked on the farm or in the bush. And so um, if I was only gone about 15 minutes, they thought, oh, it wasn't too bad. If I was gone more than 20 <laughs> minutes, they usually unpacked the dishwasher or cleaned up. <laughs> But if I was gone for after over half an hour, honest to goodness, they'd get the vacuum cleaner out, they'd put washing on, they'd make their bed because they realised I was really angry. But you know what? Who came home was a calmer, more centred and grounded human. And I wanted to model that to my boys that rather than let me let my glitter jar go crazy, then I that was the strategy that worked for me. And I think we have to work out ours as parents, particularly when our teens oh, are struggling yeah. to manage. Knowing their prefrontal doesn't finish till the mid-20s, we've got to cut them some slack. We're the ones with the prefrontal. Okay, somebody has asked, and I'll ask you this one, Caroline, um, what's the latest research about the impact of screens on social media and mental health? I'm pretty sure uh, you can give us a succinct answer on that one. <laughs> Yeah, look, it, well, yes and no. Um, it depends what screens we're talking about, actually. Some it's screens, good and bad. Some screens are good and some screens are not so good. Um, and we need to, it's more about moderation and setting, setting limits and so on than whether it's inherently good or bad. There are certainly um, some terrible uh, apps and certain things that are going around that are terrible for our kids and that make them feel bad about themselves. And we know the body image and all of that is a, is a really big problem. But we do need to be careful not to throw the, the baby out with the bathwater because for some kids, online forums are their only source of social connectedness. Yep. And so it's not so much that screens and social media are bad, it's about what they are looking at on the screens. <coughs> <clears throat> yeah. And is that helpful to them or is it not helpful to them? Because we've got a lot of kids that come into our clinic who, if they didn't have their social media and their social forums where they find kids just like them, um, they wouldn't have anything. And so I think we just need to be really careful that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater with, with some mm. of those things. That part aside, though, we also need to be very careful about what we're letting kids have access to and what other people are letting our kids have access to. So the, the, the research isn't, isn't this way or that way because it's all, it, there's so many different things that people are looking at um, that some, some are coming out with that, that can be helpful and many are coming out to say that it's unhelpful. So I think we need to look more at the type of screen and the type of app that we're talking about. I mean, you know, we talk about, Smiling Mind, that's also a screen. That's an app. That's an app on a, on a, on a mobile phone. That's great. Um, so I, I, I think we need to just be careful that we're not, yeah, yeah, that we're not dichotomizing in that sense. Yeah. So on my Parental as Anything podcast, not only do I have one with Dr. Christy Goodwin, I also have one about gaming. Um, and that's the same sort of thing that we need to explore it. And it's not all demonizing it because we know lots of kids with. Uh, social anxiety have, have found a friendship in that space which they've then be able to um, continue in a real world so it's not all bad and they tried parts, yeah it's it's They're forming tried. that of orcs or <laughs> goblins or whatever it might be um okay so um suicide's obviously a key a mental health concern and we all um um have enormous concerns around that and have done for a number of years all three of us um, and I want to touch on a couple of things here. And the first one is uh, a very specific kind of question. Apparently, there was a couple of people who asked this question is what sorts of suggestions do you have to protect men children's mental health if they have had the trauma of losing a parent to suicide? Um, and how do we address that with them? Now, just before I throw that to both of you, um, I'm obviously a, have a background in death and dying. So I'm going to say that grief is, is, is one of those things I don't think we um, talk about and understand well enough in, in our society. We're a bit death phobic around death and loss. And I think what's been going on for a lot of us over the last 18 months is multiple loss experiences that didn't involve a human body. So we've lost opportunities and lost holidays and lost um, you know, experiences and things like that, well, they all impact us and they all create a grief response. So again, let us acknowledge that we're all probably 
Um, and, and it was really interesting. This last week, I was due to be in Western Australia. All my New South Wales family were going to head to WA. All of us were going to connect up to meet some new grandies that we hadn't seen. 40th birthday. First time we're all together since one of the weddings a few years ago and we had to cancel. Well, last week, I nearly cried all week just because it was the week we were all going to be together. And, you know, I'm, kid, I'm really good around grief and loss. I let the tears flow. So can you see again, there'll be things that come up that trigger our grief and loss, but then we have a very specific one. If, it, if we've already lost a parent to suicide or somebody close to us, what, what sorts of suggestions do you have? I'll start with Caroline, then I'll go to Claire. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this this may be more in Claire's area, but um, when I when we see kids um, who've lost a parent to suicide, I think it's it's around making sure that they've got other people that they can talk about it whenever they like, that it's okay that people don't try to jolly them up. I think that that's a natural response. Fix yeah. them. <laughs> fix them, but because people don't like seeing a, a child, <clears> up, <throat> yeah. You know, so they try to jolly them out or distract <clears throat> them or whatever, and it's actually a really important process that they that they process the death and they process the loss. And if they want to talk about it at any time, they have to be able to do that with yeah. whoever they want to do it with. And so as long as if they can feel that it's okay, that they're not burdening people by talking about it or crying or whatever it might be, I think that out of everything is the most important is to let them. Don't stop them. Just let them do it. Let them do whatever they need to do to process because, you know, depending on their age, you can have all sorts of, I'm sure, Maggie, that you would know that, yeah. um, you know, it, it comes out in all sorts of different ways depending on their it development. It does. It often comes out in anger. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it comes out in all sorts of other ways. And it can, and it doesn't come out evenly. It can come, oh. you know, it bubbles up sometimes. And we know that even with children, they tend to be puddle jumping. They can be sad and then they can be really happy and forget about it, whereas, after we've gone through puberty and grown up and our limbic brain's grown, we can't just put it down, but being able to carry it and then be able to be an adolescent would be particularly difficult, um, you know, with all the other things that are going on for them. So, Claire, any other suggestions around that one? Well, I think that that key thing is really their feelings are okay. Their feelings are correct. And the thing is that, Saying that is one thing, but what are we actually modelling? I mean, are you trying to hide your tears from a child that's been bereaved? Because why? Mm -hmm. Now that all that does is show them that other people have this grief as well. You know, if you get angry, do you express it or do you bottle it up? You know, if they say, you know what, I really hate this person for doing this, for leaving us, don't say, oh, you know, it, it, being angry doesn't help. Say, yeah, you know what, sometimes I'm angry too because it's not going to always be like that. Sometimes it's just going to be sadness. Sometimes they are going to actually get caught up in, in really great memories and, 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 and that's going to be really complicated as well. Um, and get help if, you know, if things do not seem to be improving, if we're not seeing that puddle jumping. You know, I mean, a lot of the time kids and, and adolescents as well, they will exactly, you know, one minute they're crying and the next minute they're chasing their cousins at the funeral. That's normal. But if they can't puddle jump, then you probably need to yeah. seek help sooner rather than later. Yeah. You've got to, got to think of suicide bereavement as, as a traumatic event. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And keep an eye out. You know, it might be weeks or months later that you actually start to see uh, what the long-term results might be. And sometimes we, um, you may lose a parent when you're a child and often it's the adolescent window when it all revisits, when the limbic brain mm -hmm. grows that you might find all of a sudden now you've got a very angry or a very sad child and that's that can be a little bit confusing and that's when sometimes you do need um, someone who's um, good in that area just to guide you through it or to guide your child through it. So Claire. No, I um, think, if I, sorry, if I could yeah. just say one thing, yeah. one last yeah. thing on that. I think that, um, you know, I've, I've often hear people talking about, you know, we, we can't pathologise grief and that's absolutely true. We, we've got to recognise that grief is a range of processes um, but at the same time, when grief has become too much, when a person is not functioning, when a person doesn't have good days, then at that point, you know, it, it's not about pathologising a normal process. It's about recognising that normal grief can develop into something else. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, no question. There's kind of a bit of a pit that you need to kind of, mm. you know, we recommend, but it can get stuck. Mm. And oh, that yeah. is a little bit like, you know, when we were talking about when anxiety becomes problematic, if we can't live our life, um, we can't function in relationships. And we really, that, that means it's probably become problematic. Okay, Claire, um, what do we do if our child is having suicidal thoughts? So we've actually asked them and they've said, yes, they are. Can you walk us through that? Mm, sure. And, and thank you for saying, saying it exactly like that, because that is actually the really important first step is that if we've got suspicions that a young person might be having thoughts of suicide, we do need to ask them directly and in a way that is unambiguous. No, I, have you been thinking about killing yourself? Are you having thoughts of suicide? Not are you thinking about hurting yourself? Not you wouldn't kill yourself, would you? Which very clearly communicates that we want the answer to be no. Look, the, 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 the main thing to remember is that um, as once somebody has started to talk about their suicidal thoughts, there is actually a degree of safety that's achieved there because being alone with those thoughts is much more dangerous than being with another person with those thoughts. Um, if, if a young person's been thinking about suicide, the chances are pretty good that that's been taking up a huge amount of their emotional space for however long it might be. And even if the thoughts have only been there for a short period, it's likely that there have been other struggles, you know, in the past, depression, anxiety, um, maybe self-injury, which is which can be a precursor to thoughts of suicide, can be a way of managing suicidal thoughts even. Um, so next thing to do is really to, to start thinking about how you can work together to keep them safe for now. You know, recognising that suicide crises, they're not up here for months at a time. You know, if a young person's having thoughts of suicide, the chances are once you can help to get some of the heat out of that, that emotion, then, you know, the, the, the immediate crisis will probably pass and it may come back. Um, but you want to find out um, if there is a plan for suicide, if there, and it's not to say that kids who haven't made a plan won't act on thoughts of suicide. In fact, it can be quite impulsive, but understanding that um, if someone has begun to, to put together something that they need to act on their thoughts of suicide that, you know, this could be the time to say, well, you know what, I think that, that those, those tablets or whatever it might be, let's put them away somewhere safe so that, you know, at the moment we can focus on talking amongst ourselves. Recognise that professional help is probably a really, really, really important thing right now. Um, professional may well talk to a young person and say, well, look, this is not it's very unlikely that this young person is going to act on their thoughts of suicide. They're feeling supported now. We do need to get some um, some supports in place. But as a parent, if your instinct is, but I want them to be in hospital where they are locked up and there is no access to weapons and that's the only way I'm going to keep them safe. Actually being able to talk about it is a much better way of keeping them safe. Um, so, yeah, look, that's that's really the key things. And, and being able to be genuinely curious about what is going on for them. You know, this is a, you know, this, would, this is a really horrible thing to be thinking about. You know, I can imagine that you must be feeling really exhausted. You know, can you tell me what's been going on? What do you think that, what do you think would be different if you weren't here? You know, is there something in particular that's triggered your big feelings today? Um, and being okay about having a conversation with them about it that says, well, you know, this is really serious and recognising just how serious this is minim without minimising it, but also not saying, well, you can't do that. You know, you don't you dare do this to your father and I or the family or the classroom, whatever it might be. Actually being able to talk about it is really important. And I've got to say, you know, I think that probably one of our most, you know, sort of think of it as a really sticky piece of myth information um, is that people who talk about suicide don't do it. And the reality is that in the vast majority of cases, when someone has died by suicide, they have tried to communicate with somebody about their intentions beforehand. And of, often we either we think we either think, well, you know, people who talk about it don't do it, which is again not true, um, or we don't necessarily have the tools to recognise what it is. Um, so you know, when for example, I think of a, a few years ago at a, a funeral um, for a sort of a friend of a friend who had died by suicide, mm. everyone was saying, you know, well, I don't know why he didn't tell anyone. He didn't, there was no signs. But a couple of hours later, you start hearing things like, there was this one time I had a feeling he was trying to tell me something. 
or, you know, okay, in retrospect, he did, you know, there were times when it felt like, you know, he was talking about feeling like a burden or something like that. But if we've actually got the, the, the courage and no question, this is a scary thing to do, but the courage to actually say, you know, gosh, you know, when I hear someone talking about feeling like a burden, that to me, that is a red flag. They might be having thoughts of suicide. Um, can you tell me, have you been having thoughts of suicide? Not being afraid to, you know, to look it in the eye and say, well, this must be hard. What can we do to keep you safe? Yeah, and I want to mention that, uh, Claire, you helped um, with my episode on parental as anything where we talked about suicide with um, Professor Matt Coleman and, and very much both of you gave that message again that, you know, people are still really wary of asking that question because they think mm. there's this myth that that could give them the idea that, and that's absolutely not what the research shows, that we have no. to be more fearless in that direction. Um, and I think I think one of the best things um, of your program that you're taking to schools is that we then give um, uh, our teens the information on also how to be that, what do they do? Because so often they'll be protecting a friend Oh, yeah. um, but when they've done your program, they know exactly that they have that capacity to ask that question and to take the steps to protect them. And I know that, um, you know, that's the sort of stuff that does save lives. It can't just be grown ups. It's actually who do they confide in and and keeping secrets. You know, that one came up sometimes in my counselling and I would say, look, you know, at the end of the day, um, what is your gut saying? Because once again, kids kind of get mm. to feel uncomfortable too. We really have to validate that. Um, you know, they're, oh, yeah. they're, you don't have to be depressed to actually um, contemplate or complete a suicide that sometimes it's it's a really impulsive thing because all of a sudden everything just seems so dark and helpless and hopeless that I just want to escape that pain. And, and it's not rational. You know, it's not a rational choice in that moment. And I think the better informed, you know, we all are. And that's been something that's, uh, you know, once again, I'm really absolutely love that that's exactly what we're doing with our young people and when they have conversations you have a very different conversation when they've done when they've done the course you know they oh, yeah. they kind of are more open about it it does shift that stigma and it's one of our biggest challenges isn't it that help seeking behavior is a sign that somehow we're weak and we're not we're human and oh. every one <laughs> of us so strange be... because it's an incredibly hard thing to do so surely doing it is the tough thing and like yet we're that, all quick to offer help. incredible sign and strength. We're yeah. really quick to offer it, aren't we? But we yeah. just don't want to go and seek it. And I think the other thing that we have to have conversations with our teens around is um, what are the things that nurture and protect you? You know, when I've worked with a um, one that's had a you know an attempt, I'll go, so what, are you, what, what sorts of things put a smile on your face and puts a spark in your life? And they'll go, oh, yeah, walking the dog and you're playing basketball and riding my bike or going fishing. You think, so when did you last do it? And they went, no, not for a long time, right? Just, yeah. I haven't done that for a long time. I said, so, you know, sometimes we've all got to recognise what are the things that lift me up and are good for me and with no question around young people, it's you've got to get enough sleep as a big ballpark figure. And I think that when we address that issue, they learn better, they're nicer to their parents and their siblings, but they're more mentally happier. And so some of the messages that we want to get out are really very basic, you know, that we all need human connectedness. We need good food. We need some exercise. We need to do things that make us laugh and smile. And yeah. so it's, you know, at the end of the day, that's the sort of stuff that we're trying to get out there in terms of information. But it's beautiful that we need them to know that we can all stumble. If you mm. haven't been brought to your knees, look, at some point in life, you probably will. I've been there a few times. But each time I did get there, a part of me learnt, you know what, I've been here before and I can get up. But when you're a teen, you don't always have that awareness yet. Yep, which is that the other part to this is every single young person has to have that significant adult ally who might not be mum and dad. You know, I call them lighthouse figures because, you know, I had a few in my life and, um, you know, I had a teacher that just, saw me when I was really struggling in a dark place. Um, How much of a gift is that though? Gosh, that's it. And you so remember I, them I forever, don't you? <laughs> a lighthouse for the students I taught and I'm a lighthouse as an auntie 
And it really is, you know, it's not hard to do, is it? You know, it's not hard to do to send a text to say, how'd, you, how'd your test go? Did you, <laughs> let's meet for a cuppa. Do you want to go for a bike ride? It's just connection. Every single mm. human is hungry for it. Now, teens, even though we think that they've got it, they've got a virtual connection. It's not quite the same. And so I think that's my challenge is have dates with your mum or your dad or your, your cousin or your uncle or your grandparents. We love a good date um, because it really fills us all up. It's not just about young people. So we're getting to the end of tonight. would like you to think what last message, Caroline, oh. would you like to give to um, our educators and parents and anyone else who's listening? Yeah, I guess overall, and, and you know, to go summarise in lots of ways, talk, talk to the kids, listen, don't lecture, um, and you know, give your, give give yourselves a break as well. You're all under a lot of pressure of being, um, you know, cooped up with family and so on. It's hard. It's hard on the kids. It's hard on you. It's hard on the teachers. It's going to be hard on everyone going back. So, you know, just just take it easy in those first few weeks as you come back and. Be kind to yourselves and understand that it mm. will be hard, but it will get easier. Claire? Oh, you. thank you for using the word kind. I actually think that this is really, really important. I think that there's a lot of this feeling of, you know, if I don't know the exact right thing to say, I should just keep my mouth shut. But actually, I don't think that you can make anything worse by starting from a place of just genuine kindness. And just um, unnecessarily kind, I think it's a good way to be, you know, go out of your way, just a little bit of a, of a nicer time. But um, I, I think that, you know, the, the main message is, I guess, talk, listen a lot more than you talk, mm -hmm. talk about things that don't matter, talk about things that have just come up um, as they come up. Um, and if you get it wrong, own it. You know, if you say, you know what, I just, I realise I kind of went down a really weird path with you in this conversation and um, I think I got caught up in my own stuff. I'm feeling a bit scared about some of what we're talking about, but I really want to focus on you. So let's just take a step back. You know, if you actually own that, then it makes them makes it a lot easier for them to, to um, admit their own difficulties as well in the same way that if sometimes, you know, mum just says, you know, this day has sucked from beginning to end and I'm going to sit here and watch Netflix and eat chocolate and maybe have a bit of a cry. Do you want to join me? You know, why not? You know, I think that, you know, they, we talk about how you know, there's that terrible moment when kids realise that their parents are actually just humans. <laughs> Less of a shock if they realise that sooner. I think that's a really, really good thing. We're all human and doing the best we can with what we know and some days we get it better than others. And I think it's, can we just accept the fact that we need to be good enough humans because there's no perfect and Insta's full of rubbish. Um, my last two tips really are probably, I'm a firm believer in, in recognising gratitude. And I do think that there are some things that I'm really grateful for um, that I've lived through this pandemic um, because I, I've recognised that I was working way too hard and I was travelling far too much. And I was always 18 months out of bookings and I couldn't sort of cancel them because it we, and then I, all of a sudden the universe just went phoom, all gone. Um, and I'm, I'm much healthier because I <laughs> am not exhausted and I'm sleeping a lot, which is great. And then my last one is hope. And I am going to say that sometimes we, there is a science around hope. It's not just fluffy stuff. And one of my things that, you know, I've been saying to parents who've been in lockdown long periods of time is to get a giant piece of paper and start planning what you are going to do when we have the freedoms. Where do we go as a family? What do we want to see? Who do we want to see? Um, are we going camping? Are we going to Ayers Rock? Are we going Uluru? Are we going up to fly? What are we going to do? What adventure are we going to do as a family when this is when this is kind of out the other side? Because we don't know when it's going to finish, and that does our head in because without cognitive closure. But what we do know is that we will be able to create something that our family is going to have some memories that will, you know, possibly be the ones they remember. I don't think kids think kids are going to focus on the stuff that necessarily they missed out on. I reckon they're going to look at the, the endless pancake sessions or the movies in the middle of the day with popcorn. I think they're going to look at some stuff like the drawings on the footpaths 
and the teddy bears in the windows and the messages of hope and love they've got from people. I really do believe that um, once we're out the other side. So on behalf of all of you, Caroline and Claire and all of you wonderful people who've joined us, um, thank you. And again, I'm, you know, a huge, huge fan of lift the lid in our school so that we are able to dive in and see what else can we do to build our um, you know our resilience and capacity for our children to deal with whatever life serves up so from where we are we send you a great virtual hug because it's still legal um, and I hope <laughs> that you've enjoyed this and please share this like you will get a recording of it please share it share it with families and school communities and work communities because we all want our kids, we want your kids and our kids to thrive one day, despite living through a global pandemic. Thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you very much for, for inviting me, both Rotary and Maggie. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to be a part of. Cheers. Oh, nice. There's some nice thank yous in the, in the chat.